This is Mark Noy uh, from the Polytechnic University in Catalonia. Uh, last year we tried to invite Mark, but he was he had over commitments, but we are very happy to have him this year. Um, Mark works uh, in graph theory, in combinatorics, and he focuses mostly on uh, enumerative com uh, combinatorics and uh, uh, what is very important for our community, uh, he links combinatorics and graph theory with logic. So, and he published several papers uh, on zero-one laws and limiting distributions. And uh, today, uh, limiting probabilities. And today we'll hear, uh, we'll listen to the talk uh, co-authored by Alberto Larauri and Tobias Müller on limiting probabilities of first order sentences in sparse random graphs. So please, Mark, the screen is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'm very grateful and very honored for this uh, invitation. And uh, my co-authors are Alberto Larrauri, he's a PhD student under my supervision, and Tobias Müller from Groningen. Now, my, my main area of research is combinatorics, but since several years I've been interested in uh, logical properties of uh, random structures. <clears throat> so, just to be sure that we are uh, on the same language, of course, all of you know what is the uh, first order logic, right? The classical first order logic. And in the case of graphs, we add an adjacency relation that uh, this uh, binary predicate we shorten to x adjacent to y. We assume this to be symmetric, so there are no directions, and anti-reflexics, there are no loops. So what can you express in this first order logic of uh, graphs? Well, maybe not too much, but you can express interesting things. Like for instance, the graph contains a triangle, contains three mutually adjacent vertices. And if you think for a moment, you see that it can also express the existence of a fixed H as a subgraph. You use as many quantifiers as vertices in the graph, and you postulate the adjacencies between them. Now, even more complicated sentences, and this example will, will be of importance later, there are at most A cycles of length at most K, when A and K are fixed, 10, 50. Well, this would be a rather long sentence, uh, a bit boring to write down, but you, if you can imagine, well, there are no more than A plus one subsets of K vertices inducing a cycle. And uh, probably it is very well known that you cannot express more global properties like connectivity, planarity, or three colorability that you can indeed express in monadic cyclonal logic. But today is only going to be about the uh, first of the logic. Good. I if there are any questions you can ask, uh, I have planned my slides to have plenty of time. So uh, uh, you are invited to ask or uh, questions. Now, this is for the logic. For the graphs, we are using the classical GNP model of random graphs. We fix some uh, P between zero and one. Uh, the vertices are from one to n, so this means that the vertices are distinguishable. We will not care about automorphisms. And then we put every edge rj in this random graph independently with probability p. This is not the uniform distribution. The probability of a graph is p to the number of edges times one minus p to the number of non-edges. So n to two is the total number of possible edges. So this distribution is not uniform, but uh, this model has been very well studied for the last, I would say now, 60 years. The expected number of edges is the probability of an edge times the total, the possible number of edges n to two. So you see, it depends as p n square over two. If p is constant, then the number of edges is quadratic, and this is called dense graphs. But if p is proportional to one over n, then you see if p is one over n, then the number of edges in expectation is linear. And this is what I will call sparse graphs. And today we are going to concentrate only on sparse graphs. And sparse graphs, it's a regime in which the most interesting phenomena in uh, this model of random graphs uh, occur. So, 
Again, I, I just uh, shorten GN to the random graph with the probability of an edge is C over N. Okay, I hope this is uh, clear. And then maybe the most important thing here is the well-known phase transition. If C is below one, then all connected components in the random graph are either trees or have a unique cycle. A unique cycle is a unicyclic subgraph. And moreover, they are small. They are of size at most log n. But the important thing here is that all components are simple. Simple means that the number of edges is at most the number of vertices, either n or n minus one. And a complex component is a component in which the number of edges is larger than the number of uh, vertices. But for C larger than one, a sudden change uh, occurs. And then there is a unique component of linear size, which we call the giant component. Now, uh, this C is the expected degree of a vertex. And now this phenomenon is very well understood. If you are starting at the vertex and then explore the neighbors and the neighbors, this is a branching process whose expected value is C. And if the branching process is subcritical with this condition, then it will die away very soon. And this is, let's say, the intuition behind uh, this radical change of, uh, of uh, structure for the subcritical random graphs and for the supercritical. Now, one can say, or it, it, we could say that first of the logic cannot capture this transition. Why? Because in first of the logic, we cannot express if a graph has a cycle or not, or if it has a unique cycle. We can express that it has a cycle of length eight or any constant, but we cannot express, and this is provable, that first of the logic is not powerful enough to express being a cyclic or not. But this intuition here was made precise, very precise, in the following re result. So again, Gn will be this uh, random graph. And given a property A, given by a first order sentence, right, in which every var var variable is quantified, so that this expresses a, a graph property uh, invariant and their isomorphism, we are interested, which is the probability that the random graph satisfies this property? For instance, that it contains a triangle, or that it has four cycles of a given length, or that it contains K4 as a component. And we are interested in the limited probability when the number of vertices goes to infinity. So we will always be talking about the asymptotic regime. Now, James Lynch, now maybe almost 30 years ago, he proved the following. For every property, this limit exists. Well, this limit will depend on the property and will depend on the value of C that we have taken. But here I emphasize that I consider this as a function of C. And this function of C can be expressed only just basic sums and products and a set of constants and exponential. So it's not only a continuous function, it's a C infinite function, it's an analytic function. It's, it, there is no, no, no change, no, nothing that happens when you go from C less than one to C larger than one. So uh, in some technical sense, this says that this phase transition cannot be expressed, cannot be captured by properties that are satisfied asymptotically or not um, when the number of vertices goes to infinity. So you, you don't see any difference with C. You really don't see any difference with C. Can I ask a no. question? Yes. Uh, but you could potentially construct something like e to the x over one plus e to the x, like a function which goes from zero to one using the exponential sums and multiplication. No, 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 no. These are not exponentials of exponentials, right? It's not every combination of this, right? So these exponentials are just parameters of Poisson distributions and you just take linear combinations of this, it's not that you can use any combination of exponentials, Sergey. It is really analytic and, and well-defined. So okay? what, what does it mean uh, so when you say set of constants and exponentials, what does it actually mean? Well, maybe I should have been more precise. I should have been, these are the set of constants of certain distributions 
uh, parameters of Poisson distributions and single exponentials and linear combinations of these or sums of products of these. Okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Now, uh, Alberto May's student has uh, recently generalized this result to sparse hypergraphs. And uh, maybe I will say something at the end about the uh, hypergraphs, which is also uh, an interesting line of uh, research. So these are the limiting probabilities. And then the, 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 the lesson is that first of the logic cannot distinguish between the, the two regimes. Now, what we did here is we consider not a single first order sentence or property, but we consider the set of all limiting probabilities for a given C, we consider the set of all limiting probabilities of first order properties, all of them. Well, this is a countable set because the number of sentences is, is countable, is symmetric with respect to one half, just by negation. And we consider the closure inside the interval zero one. And then we ask ourselves, how is this closure how is this, uh, when you take the closure of the set of limiting probabilities, what happens? And then we discover this uh, rather unexpected thing. There is a, a constant, which is this 0 0.9 something. It is the unique positive root of a certain simple equation. And then the following happens. Uh, this closure is always a finite union of closed intervals. Secondly, if you are above C0, or you are exactly at C0, then it is dense. The closure is the whole interval. But if you are below, and of course positive, there is at least one gap. There is at least one sub-interval that is not covered by the closure. This was a bit of a surprise. We were looking for something that changed given value of C and more or less, maybe we were expecting that this change would happen at C equals to one, which is the phase transition, but it is not. And then, which I think is even more interesting, uh, there is this constant, which by the way is below one, <clears throat> and there is a sudden change into the, not the single limiting probabilities, but the set of all limiting probabilities. <clears throat> Good, so this is the statement. And the rest of my talk, besides uh, some comments at the end and some extensions that we are working in, will be to give you an idea of how to prove this theorem. Okay, good. Oh, which is the motivation? Well, the motivation is that some years ago, uh, with some uh, Tobias Muller and other co-authors, we look at random planar graphs. This is a different model. We take the set of all labeled planar graphs we consider the uniform distribution with n vertices, so there are no independent probabilities. And then we ask ourselves the same question, what is the closure of the set of limiting probabilities? And then we saw it was a finite union of intervals. In fact, these many intervals, which are very short. For the class of uh, random forest, the cyclic graphs, these are four intervals, and these are given numbers. For instance, this 0.6, it's e to the minus one half. And for every close which is close under min class which is close under minors, and well, this is a very natural concept in, in graph theory, and this is always a finite union of intervals. So our starting point was, well, we have seen this phenomena, we know some techniques, how to prove this kind of results. What happens in this sparse class? Because minor closed class are sparse, they have at most a linear number of edges. So this was the, the motivation. Now, what is the sketch of the proof? Uh, again, uh, here is the statement. You take the set of limiting probabilities of first order properties. You take this special number, which is the unique root of this. And then uh, these are the three statements we have to prove. And there will be three parts. When C is above one, there is no gap, right? The closure is everything. When you are below C zero, there is at least one gap. You miss at least one sub-interval. And then the last part, which is maybe the, needs a bit of more work, is that again, between C zero and one, there is no gap. And if you put this together, you get these two statements. 
And along the proof, we'll see that this is always a finite union of intervals. So it's not a complicated set. It's a finite union of intervals, but the behavior depends on C, and we'll see which is the role, which is the combinatorial meaning of this constant. Okay, so we proceed with the first part, no gap. This is, in some sense, the simplest one. And what we do is we take in this random graph, we take a random variable, which is the number of cycles of length k, which is the number of k cycles. And in fact, it is well known that this random variable converges in distribution to a Poisson law, whose parameter is precisely c to the k divided by 2k. Well, if you are familiar with this kind of probabilistic statements, this is not difficult to prove by the method of moments. You compute the first moment, the second moment, and all factorial moments, and then using uh, th that this uh, Poisson distribution is characterized by the moments you prove this. And moreover, if you fix k, let's say k up to 10 or 20, uh, then the number of triangles, quadrangles, and cycles of length k are asymptotically independent. Now we consider this random variable, which is the number of cycles of length at most k, right? And, uh, and since they are independent, this converges to a Poisson law whose parameter is the sum of these parameters. Now I observe that this mu k, this is a, when k goes to infinity, this is a divergent. If c is larger than one, well, this is an exponential. And if c is equal to one, this is a harmonic series. But in any case, when c is either one or larger than one, then this is divergent. Is this clear? Okay. Uh, again, if you have questions, uh, you can ask. Now, I recall, as I said at the beginning, that the probability that the number of k cycles is at most a constant, this is expressible in first order logic. This is a piece in the, in the argument. Now, by the central limit theorem, since these are independent and asymptotically, and this is okay, then this converges to a normal law. So the probability that this is less than mu plus this deviation of order square root n, then this converges to the distribution function of the, of the normal law. And this is a continuous distribution. So we have a sequence of discrete distributions and by the central limit theorem, they converge to a continuous distribution. Now we want to show that every number P can be approximated by limiting probabilities of first order properties. So I take my P and I take an epsilon, which will be the error. And I want to be more than this error because this is continuous and this uh, function covers all the values between zero and one. There is an x such that the, uh, this uh, error function is uh, equal to p, okay? And then because, uh, uh, because, uh, because of this convergence, we take mu zero such that this probability is closer to p than epsilon for mu greater than zero. This is what does it mean to be this uh, limiting. And finally, we take a k such that mu k is above this mu zero. And this is guaranteed because the limit of the mu case is equal to infinity. Now, this property here, okay, the property that this Poisson is less than this is the same that this random variable is less than this value. So this is first order expressible. And we have shown that every P between zero and one can be approxim epsilon approximated by some limiting probability of a first order sentence. Hence, this is dense and the closure is the interval zero. Well, this is an easy argument and we are, you see, we are only using uh, elementary tools. So if everyone is happy, then we move to the second part. Okay, we move to the second part and we want to show that when we are below this C zero, there is at least one sub-interval that is not covered. Now we have to do two things, to go deeper into the structure of this random graph. And again, we have to, to explain what is the 
combinatorial minimum of this constant C0. So what Erdos really proved in this subcritical, remember that here all components are either trees or unicycles, but even more is true. This is a union of trees, which is a forest, and age is a union of unicyclic graphs. This is given by the result I just mentioned. But then something else happens. Every fixed tree appears in this forest as many times as you wish. For every fixed tree and multiplicity, this random forest contains at least n copies of t. Uh, this means that if we restrict to this forest, to the forest part, and we forget about the unicyclic uh, part, then there is a zero one law. The limiting probability that this forest satisfies a first order property converges and it is either zero or one. Why is this? Well, Fn contains arbitrarily many copies of each tree. So to these two random instances of this random forest cannot really be distinguished by FO uh, properties. <coughs> if you know uh, <coughs> the Ehrenfeucht uh, Freise games, then this is clear because in this uh, two players game, a uh, duplicator can always win because you can always find a copy of a tree uh, where you can play your, uh, your round on the game, right? If you don't, if you are not familiar, I, I'm sure that in this community, many of you will be familiar with this, these combinatorial games, which is a, <coughs> a basic ingredient of uh, finite model theory. But uh, this is the intuition behind if you are not familiar. So here, either the limiting probability when restricted to the forest, either it is zero, it's almost surely false, or M is almost surely true. Now we go to this uh, constant, and I say, the limiting probability, well, F is the property of this random graph being a cyclic. So is the limiting probability, oh, sorry, oh, excuse me, that uh, this HN is empty, that you only have components which are trees, okay? And this is, what is this limiting probability? It's relatively easy to show because of this asymptotic independence that this is infinite product given by the Poisson distribution. You do a little algebra, oh, excuse me. You do a little algebra and you find this function, okay? Here is a plot of this function. When C goes to zero, the probability of being a cyclic goes to one. When you approach the critical point of the phase transition, the probability of being a cyclic goes to zero. And C0 is exactly the point, which is 0 0.9 something, when the probability is one half. So C0 is this constant when the probability that the random graph is a cyclic is exactly one half. Now I take a first order property. What I'm going to write down here should be limiting probability of A when A goes to infinity. But then, then the, the screen would be too crowded, so I'm using these as limiting probabilities. And I just use this uh, elementary law of total probabilities. The probability of A is the probability of A conditioned to F times the probability of F. The probability of F was this. And the probability of A conditioned to non-F times the complementary probability one minus CF. Now we have say that this probability of A condition to this random forest is either zero or one. If it is one, if this is one, uh, then this probability is at least Fc, but since we are here below, the probability is larger than one half, right? Because this function is decreasing. At C zero, the probability is exactly one half. So if you are below, right, uh, this function, and this function is uh, decreasing, and, uh, and then the probability will be larger. Good. And so you see, if this happens, this probability is larger than one half. If on the other hand, the probability of A condition to the forest is zero, and this is zero, then this probability is at most a probability times one minus F of C, which is larger, smaller than one half. 
So no probability, no probability can be between one minus f of c, which is less than one half, and f of c, which is larger than one half. And this is a gap. Just by this property, well, I remark this is not a first order property. Okay, being a cyclic, this is not a first order property. But if I take any first order property, conditioning to f, it's either one or it's either zero by the arguments uh, before. Good, very good. So this is the, the second part. Are there any questions so far? Good. Now, we have to show finally that in between this critical value here and one, again, there is no gap. And also we'll see uh, that these uh, limiting probabilities, uh, the closure is a union of uh, finitely many intervals. Good. So the structure of the random graph here, since we are in the subcritical uh, regime, actually this should be less than one because the case C equals to one has already been covered here. So maybe this, this I really should, should have put here less than one because we are in the subcritical regime and then there are only trees and unicyclic components. There is another piece that we, are in, that we need, that this part of the unicyclic components in expectation is bounded. So you have to imagine this random graph that has not a giant forest, a super giant forest, that with high probability contains everything except a constant number of vertices, and this constant number of vertices form the unicyclic components. Maybe I should have put a drawing. I, 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 I hope everyone knows, have the image of a unicyclic graph as a cycle in which you, we attach uh, rooted trees to any of, uh, of its vertices. Restricting to this forest, we have a zero one law. So uh, this forest with respect to first order property, they always satisfy the same properties. So whether uh, this random graph satisfies a property depends only on Hn that we call the fragment. Well, this notion of fragment was introduced by Colin McDiarmi in a different context, and we find it convenient to use also the fragment. Okay, well, I'm making signs with my hands, but I, I realize you cannot see me because this is really my, my first online talk. So I will try to, to explain verbally. There is this huge forest, contains almost everything, and there is a bounded part, at least bounded in expectation, that contains these unicyclic components, and we call the fragment. Now, what we prove, and this takes some, well, this, uh, this needs some work, the probability that the fragment is isomorphic to a given collection of unicyclic graphs converges as n goes to infinity. So the limiting probability that the fragment is isomorphic, let's say to one triangle with these trees attached or one, one pentagon with these trees attached converges. And the limit depends only on this function f that we defined before on the constant c on the number of vertices and on the number of automorphisms. The number of automorphisms is rather natural because this H is an unlabeled graph. And what is the probability that this label graph is isomorphic to this unlabeled graph? It is quite natural that the automorphisms of this uh, play a role. Good. So the probability that the fragment is isomorphic to this fixed H converges to this constant. Now, what happens that the probability that a random graph satisfies a property, you have to sum over all fragments that together with the forest make the property whole. Because we just said that this property depends only on the fragment. So the probability that GN satisfies the property, you have to sum over all fragments that make this probability, this property whole. So this is a this is a sum, probably an infinite sum, but it is a subsum of this convergent series. 
Well, we have to show that this is a full probability. So if you sum this pH over all possible fragments, you get one. And then it follows that this closure we are interested is the collection of subsums of this series. It is not immediate, okay? So when I say that uh, this uh, limiting probability is equal to this sum, then you need some work to show that actually the closure is the collection of subsums of this series. This is not difficult. You have to write it down, and this this is this is so in our paper, which is available in the yeah, as an archive uh, file. But at least now we have a description of this set, which is the thing we are interested in. Uh, these pH are well defined. For every fragment, you can compute this pH. You take this series, which is convergent, and the sum is equal to one, and then you consider all the subsums, either finite or infinite. These are non-negative terms. So even if you take infinite of them, this will always be convergent because this is a, an, a, an unconditionally convergent series of non-negative terms. So this is what really makes the analysis uh, pro possible, that we have characterized our set in terms of subsums of a series. Okay. Any questions before? No? Okay, I'm checking the time. I think I'm doing fine. Now, there is this result. It was somehow mentioned by Kakeya, Kakeya, the famous Kakeya of Kakeya sets, about a century ago, but he really didn't prove it. But it was, then there were some intermediate papers. This is just a result on analysis. Maybe. I could say first year analysis. Well, for good students of first year. It says, you take a convergent series of non-negative terms, right? So the PN are non-negative and the series is convergent. And we are interested in the set of some sums of this convergent series. If we have this condition that for every term of, of the series, the i-th term is less than the tail for every term in the series, then the set of subsums is the whole possible interval between zero and the sum of the series. So this is the empty sum, and this is the sum consisting of all the terms. And if this condition holds, then the set of sum sums is precisely this. This is a very interesting paper because it says that if otherwise the term is larger than the tail, then this set is either a Cantor set or a modification of a Cantor set. So you have these really two extremes. Either it's a very simple set, which is a union, it's, it's a whole interval, or it is a Cantor set. And if you want to just check, take the geometric series of ratio one half, which follows into this. And if you take the geometric series of ratio one third, then you get exactly the Cantor set, okay? Because you are the triadic expression of the, of the numbers between zero and one. Good, so what we do is the following. This is the sum we are considering. Well, this doesn't look like a series, but we can turn it into a series by ordering the limiting probabilities of the fragments. So we have all these possible infinite fragments. And then what we do is that these probabilities of the fragments here, we order in decreasing order. Let me tell you that always this ordering will depend on the constant C because since these probabilities depend on C, this ordering will change with C. What does not change is that the larger probability is always that the fragment is empty. And fragment empty, okay, fragment empty means that the graph is a cyclic. Is that clear? Okay, fragment empty, fragment empty means that the graph has no HN, so no unicyclic graphs, so it is a, it is a cyclic. Good. 
Now we have to check this condition here, that the term is less than the tail. And then we consider how many vertices has the fragment H. And we say, okay, if we say some the, the probabilities of the fragments for all vertices with K vertices, because of the previous formula, we get this. And then we show that this condition that the turn is less than the tail, it's true for all the fragments of size at least four. Because you can have enough H with very few automorphisms so that this sum grows very large and you can prove that this sum is above the ith term of the series. Now, every fragment has size at least three and the only fragment of size three is a triangle and there you can complete the argument. And as I said before, P0 is the probability. Can you remind what is the, the PK? Oh, the PK are the limiting probabilities of the fragment ordered in decreasing order. But what right. does the index stand for? The index just stands here. The largest probability, which always is going to be the probability of being a cyclic, and then maybe the probability that the fragment is a triangle, all the possible fragments, each of them has a given probability. Okay, so what we do is just we order them in decreasing order, whatever it is. But here, this is not a PK. This is the sum of all PI when the number of vertices in the fragment is K. Is that clear now? Okay. Okay, good. So this is true for all fragments of size at least four and for fragments of size three. But there is still one, which is the fragment, empty fragment. And here we have to show that P0, which is the largest of them, the tail, because it is ordinarily is one minus P0. So we have to check this condition. But this condition that means that P0 is about one half. But P0 is about one half precisely because C is about C0. Because when P is equal to one half, when P is equal to C0, the probability of being a cyclic is one half. When we are above, uh, this probability is uh, larger because this function was decreasing. When we are above this value, the probability is less than one half. So really, we have covered all the cases. And this completes the proof, well, except <clears throat> that there is another companion of this theorem if that if this condition then the turn is less than the tail not for all i but for i large enough then this set is a union of finitely many intervals and this is a condition that is already contained in this uh, in this uh, in this check that we did below so summarizing we have shown that this is always a union of intervals above or at c0 there are no gaps and below C0, there is at least one gap. Good. There are more questions one could ask. Uh, how many gaps are depending on C? And if anyone is interested, you can ask in the questions about this, uh, this thing. Well, this Just is- Just summarize, what do you call, uh, call a fragment? The fragment- So it's related it, to the sentence from the first order sentence or from no, like the fragment, structure? The fragment is the collection, I think it's defined here. What is the fragment? Yeah, the fragment is defined here. No, it is, where did I define the fragment? Here. The fragment is the union of unicyclic components. There is no logic, it's only combinatorics. The components are either trees or unicycles. The fragment so is- So a the fragment is like a complex uh, subgraph. It's not complex because they, they have complexity zero. The number of edges is equal to the number of vertices. There are no complex components. Ah, so union means non-overlapping. Oh, yes. The, I mean, the, the, the connected components are disjoint, right? So you take those that are trees and the union forms a forest. 
and the union of unicyclic graphs, it's the, the, the fragment. Right? Uh, and then you enumerate over all finite uh, possibilities, like all yes, possible yes. shapes. Exactly, uh, exactly. All possible fragments. Yes, exactly. Mm. All possible fragments. Well, these graphs are finite, so the, the, this has to be finite. Good. So this then, is the how, how do you how do you deal with the automorphisms? Like they're almost surely one all no, the time. No, the, the automorphisms are here, and this is an unlabeled graph. So it's a class of isomorphic uh, graphs. Okay, and then these in the GNP the graphs are labeled. So the probability that this label graph is isomorphic to something depends on the size of the graph, on the constant that defines the the probability model. And of course, on the number of automorphisms, this is the number of automorphisms of this uh, unlabeled graph. Okay? I mean, this is something that you, you can check. You, you, you just write the probability of each unicyclic graph, you take the probability of all of them. This is a computation. And the number of automorphisms appears here. Well, now what I wanted to say are two things. We have generalized this to sparse hypergraphs. What is a hypergraph? Okay. What is this? Oh no. Okay, now. This is the hypergraphs. Well, a hypergraph, this is a uniform hypergraph in which every edge has uh, D vertices. So ordinary graphs are two hypergraphs. And then we take every D edge independently with probability P. Now Sparse means that we take the probability proportional to one over n to the d minus one. Notice that it, d is equal to one, d is equal to two, and this is one over n, which is what we had for graphs. The expected number of edges is the probability of, a, of any edge times the number of edges, so the number of d subsets. And sparse means that this is linear. And again, we have proved something similar which is we take the unique possible root of this equation. Now you see the D is here. So the root of this equation will depend on C. Okay, and then again, we prove that the limiting probabilities, the union and the closure forms a union of intervals, and we have the same uh, theorem as before. Well, it, it is not difficult. It is extending the things, but then you have to deal with automorphism of, of hypergraphs and you need some more work. Good. And I think now my time is almost over. So this is my last slide. Uh, just to mention that there are several variants that you can investigate. Okay, we have, uh, I have work on, uh, on random planar graphs, random forests, random uh, graphs from a minor closed class. We have work on GNP, and then we generalize to sparse hypergraphs. And this is a project that we have started with uh, my student and Guillem Paranau, he's a colleague now in Barcelona. And then we consider random graphs with a given degree sequence. Now, this is a model that has been very much studied in the last decades, because maybe it is closer to real, work, uh, real world networks than the GNP model. And then uh, this uh, DIN is the number of vertices of degree I, right? So you consider for every n a sequence of numbers that give you the number of vertices of degree i. Well, this has to be a feasible degree distribution. It has to be summed to an even number and blah, blah. But suppose this is the case. Well, the total number of vertices is n. And suppose that this holds, that the proportion of vertices of degree i among all vertices converges to a constant. So the proportion of vertices of degree i is asymptotically some lambda i, and you assume that the first and second moment are finite. So this is the expected degree, and this is the second moment of the degree distribution. Now there is a classical result, and this has been extended and refined, in particular by my colleague uh, Guillem, that when there is a giant component in this model, well, these model are sparse graphs, because you see the expected degree is finite, so the number of edges with high probability is going to be uh, linear uh, at most. And then you take this combination, which is the second moment minus two times the first moment. And there is a giant component, even on if this is larger than zero. And again, you can use a heuristic exploring a graph from a 
from a first vertex by a branching process and then studied when the process dies out uh, with high probability. And we consider the same. We take the closure of the set of limiting probabilities of first order properties for random graphs with this given degree sequence. Well, maybe you are aware that to study this model, you take what is called the configuration model, and then you take perfect matchings among half edges to produce a random graph with this distribution. And then the question is, what is this? And we are trying to investigate this because in fact, the GNP model at the end will be a kind of particular case of this because in the GNP model, the degree distribution is a Poisson law with very high concentration. And we have found some partial results that I will not mention because this, uh, we, this is, this is uh, working, uh, working, ongoing work. But we believe that probably just depending on this first, uh, first and second moment, we will be able to characterize this uh, limiting probability, this set of limiting probabilities and the closure, and maybe, and maybe to find some result which is similar to this, and that in particular implies this. So this is just to say that there are several interesting models that you can analyze. And we are not aware of uh, other groups that have investigated not single limiting probabilities, but the set of all of them. And uh, why do we study them? Because I think we believe it's a nice problem. Okay. So this is the end of my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Indeed, at least I do find it really interesting and nice to work with. Yes, let's thank Mark for this nice talk. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions, uh, comments, ideas for yes. other models? Okay. Please. So maybe a remark because. Uh, with graphs with given degree sequence, like I could suggest a straightforward generalization by taking graphs with uh, degree constraints, which is like a Boltzmann relaxation for given degree sequence. And if you say that the threshold point is expressed as a um, like probability of uh, having uh, no, like probability of having no unicycles is equal to one half, then um, like, of course, you could try to express very similar things. Like, it's interesting because the point of phase transition in the model of graphs with degree set constraints is also shifting. So, like, to see how they both could shift or maybe overlap, like, I, I think it's totally doable yeah. Yeah. and very interesting. Yeah. Because you mentioned your approach is not, like, pure analytic, but you're rather, like, I, I think both can be done in this case. No, no, I think we have already obtained the, the, the limiting law for the number of cycles, but it's not so straightforward as in GNP. And this is why in the team we have Guillem, which is the really expert, the real expert on this. For instance, Guillem together with uh, Reed, they have really extended the conditions for the existence of a, uh, of a, of a giant component. And, uh, but there are some things that you can prove and about also if you are in the subcritical case, what is the shape of the components and all that. But it's too early to, <clears throat> to really to, but we, we are confident that we'll, we'll be able to get to the end of this, uh, of this problem. Okay, thanks, Sergei. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, if not, I would like to ask a very general uh, question which concerns hypergraphs. So, uh, uh, I know about this phase, uh, phase phenomenon that happens for uh, regular graphs. Is it the same for hypergraphs? And that's why you take this P, which is of this order. Is it so that if P is less than uh, of, of, of a lower order, then uh, there are no big components or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. the same. Yeah, there is a phase okay. transition. There is a phase transition which if I remember correctly, it's uh, D minus two factorial over N above uh, this probability, then you have a giant component and below you have the same structure of, uh, of uh, trees and unicyclists. Of course, in a cycle, in a hypergraph, I'm, I'm, I'm saying the, 
I never remember is the type of the loose model in which the, the, the edges of the cycle intersect just at one vertex uh, consecutively. But I don't remember who did this, maybe Karonsky or uh, someone from the Poznan group. Uh, and again, there is a phase transition very similar to the one in, uh, in random graphs. Okay, thanks. And one more question. Uh, have you considered any monad monadic second order uh, sentences in uh, this well, setting? Yeah, for monadic second order, just in GNP, okay, uh, there is not necessarily convergence. So this result of Lynch, there is a paper by Shella and Spencer, and they show already that in NM MSO, you don't necessarily have a convergence. And uh, yeah, but even though, and I believe that in this model, as we did for planar graphs, because for planar graphs, we work on MSO, I think it's the case that every MSO can be approximated by FO limiting probabilities. So very likely the, the, the closure will be the same. Okay. But the main difference is already here, there are MSO properties that the limiting probability alternates between zero and one. This is this, this technique of, uh, of Spencer uh, that um, allows for construction of sentences that do not converge. Okay, okay. It's Sheila and Spencer mm -hmm. is random structure algorithms uh, and you can find a discussion there. Yes, but this is a very good question in so yes, I think. Thank you very much. And uh, if there are no more questions, let's thank yes, Mark yeah. again. Oh, yeah. There's a question. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't notice. There's oh, yeah. a question in the chat. Yes. Oh, in the chat. Okay, I should be able to access the chat. Okay, so the question is, can, okay, oh, I hear myself, I don't know why. Excuse me? Uh, can you hear me twice or once only? Okay, now it's okay. No, Sorry, I can hear you some well. technical problems. Uh, so the question is, can the closure of LC uh, is a finite union of intervals, can be yes. shown by using the fact that all what is R here? <laughs> I'm sorry. Ah, okay. This is this. Um, I think this is how you construct exactly this set uh, that you can. I don't know whether you see the question in the chat. It will be much easier for you to yeah, understand yeah, yeah. it. This uh, is almost my first time with Zoom. With Zoom, so I I think yeah, there is a chat. Oh no, there is a chat. There is a chat here. Chat. Okay chat and uh, okay can these uh, be shown by using the fact okay my answer is i don't know because i don't know what is an o minimal structure okay so i mean i'm a relatively newcomer to logic so i cannot answer this question but uh, i would be happy to discuss this because uh, uh so, so real real exponential i guess this is the reals together with the sum product and taking exponentials yes yes so the my question is that the this the set lc is uh is the definable set in the first order logic with the language of rx uh, mm -hmm. So no, according I to think, no, I don't think so. I don't think so because uh, these are the limiting probabilities. How you are you going to express these limiting probabilities in first order? But according to Lynch's theorem, this limiting probability can be uh, expressed by some finite combination of process. Well, yes, by some finite combination, right? So they exist so the and there is a finite combination, yes. So the, my question is that there is some. Uh, uh, so back to, could, could you back to go back to the Lynch's result? I think it is uh, here. Okay. okay. So my question is that uh, the uh, so I, I don't know I don't know the proof of the the Lynch's result, but ca ca can we? Uh, obtain some uh, 
Mm. Okay, so it's a bit hard to explain. Maybe we can discuss later. Yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. The proof, the, proof, the proof actually depends on just taking, well, you take the quantifier depth of a formula, suppose it is L, and then it is enough to look at cycles of length at most L, of radius at most uh, three to the L. This is a typical proof of the <coughs> of this uh, <coughs> Geisman uh, result. And then okay. you see that everything depends on this. And then there are finite number of uh, types, and then you sum of the types essentially. Okay. Okay. But we can we can discuss later if you wish. Okay, but. Okay, so I understand that maybe the answer is no. Thank you. Okay, and, and I would be grateful if you tell me about these uh, minimal uh, models that um, of course, I don't course. know about. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ryoma, for this question. It might be very inspiring. Hmm. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay, I don't see and I don't hear anymore. So let's thank Mark again. And with this, we end this session and we meet at 12.30.